Hello, welcome to the Thursday, August 13th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. In Diaries today, we have one by Russ, who, as usual, talks about tools that he lately came across and found useful. Now, actually, two things that he's sort of uh, mixing up here. First one is the motor project. Uh, looks really interesting in that it does provide standard data sets that essentially record what happens during some specific adversarial techniques. This is something I often hear people ask for where, you know, where can I find essentially sort of a packet capture that shows a particular type of attack or other logs related to this. And that's exactly what the Mortar project is doing. And uh, not just packet captures, but actually, you know, the whole data set from some of these attacks. And they sort of came up with their standard JSON format to express all the data that they have to offer. Now, Russ uses the data from Mortar to actually introduce a tool, and that tool here is Prim. I was actually surprised that I didn't come across this tool earlier. It really sort of tries to be similar to Wireshark, but for large data sets. So Prim can digest uh, multi-gigabyte files, which of course Wireshark has problems with, provides some similar functionality, but uh, can also ingest seek logs. And then with the combination of having PCAP data and seek logs in one console, also having a query language language available to query all of those logs and correlate them. Uh, looks like a real powerful tool. Haven't had a lot of time today to really experiment with the tool, but uh, certainly something that I may be doing in the future. Closest analog tool that I can think of is probably a Moloch. Now Moloch does ingest uh, PCAP data uh, very efficiently and allows you to search it in uh, similar ways. Uh, Moloch does not include seek data, uh, but actually sort of creates similar data itself. And it looks like there are some problems brewing in the Tor network. Tor, of course, usually used for anonymity is this network of systems that route traffic amongst them. But eventually the traffic has to exit the Tor network and enter the normal internet again. Researcher Nusino notes that up to 23% of the Tor exit nodes at one time or another apparently are under the control of a particular group that attempts to use these exit points for Bitcoin theft. Exit points in the Tor network pretty much behave like a regular router on the internet. So they're able to see all the clear text traffic. If you're using TLS, the traffic will be protected, but Tor itself is really just about anonymity and not about any kind of privacy in a sense that it would encrypt your traffic. These malicious exit nodes then play an additional trick called SSL strip, where they're trying to redirect you to HTTP versions of particular websites that you are trying to reach via HTTPS by preventing redirects to HTTPS versions of these sites. This allows them then to, of course, inspect traffic that's being sent to the sites. If they are seeing a Bitcoin address, they will replace it with an address that is apparently owned by this malicious group. And that's also the reason why Nusino believes that all of these malicious exit nodes are controlled by one particular group. Now, of course, there are some defenses. Yes, uh, as an individual, you can make sure that you actually use a TLS uh, to connect to a particular site, now not being sort of stuck on the HTTP version of the site. The Tor network itself tried to clean up uh, those malicious exit nodes. Of course, first they have to be identified and turned out that within 30 days, well, uh, they were pretty much all back or they were back at the same level with different exit notes. 
So at this point, it's really more or less a whack the mole game and looks like the adversary here is ready and is pre-staging some of these additional exit nodes to be back in business very quickly after an initial set is removed. And then we got a couple patches to talk about that got sort of lost in the patch Tuesday shovel. Uh, first of all, SAP released updates for its NetWeaver AS product. They also updated the advisory for the recon vulnerability that uh, was sort of on the top of the news the last few weeks for SAP users, something that's out there already uh, being exploited. In addition, they patched a number of vulnerabilities. One that's probably the more interesting here is a sort of a cross-site scripting vulnerability in the knowledge management component of NetWeaver AS. Uh, that one received a critical score of nine out of 10. And then probably also noteworthy, there are a number of missing authentication checks that are being up patched by this update. Intel also released a long list of updates uh, yesterday. And now nothing here that I find terribly exciting, but you may want to scan them and see if uh, any of the systems that you own are affected. There are a couple of sort of bias updates, for example, for server boards, also for Intel NUC, uh, there's a firmware update available. A number of driver updates that you will probably receive uh, once you're updating your operating system. So I'm not sure if you have to download this from Intel directly, but uh, you may want to probably double check that you have the latest drivers for, for example, wireless cards that are available from Intel's site. And usually I don't cover data breaches, uh, but well, I have to cover that SANS was the subject of a data breach. For more details, uh, please refer to the URL that I'll add to the show notes. There may be in the near future a webcast available that goes over more details once the investigation has concluded. And this is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.